Hello, everyone. I believe I am live, but I am going to give it a couple of seconds and then I am going to get started. Okay, people are already saying my name, so I think I am live. And I'm getting thumbs up. Okay, everyone, how are you doing? Uh, so thank you for coming to the Rehumanize Conference and thank you, Amy, for the introduction. My name is Herb Garrity and I am the Executive Director of Rehumanize International. Here at Rehumanize International, we believe in something called the consistent life ethic. And so that is exactly what I am going to talk about today in this opening session. The consistent life ethic is a universally accessible philosophy that is based on the intrinsic value of each and every individual human being. In a nutshell, it means that we oppose aggressive violence against human beings in all stages of life and in all circumstances. I am going to explain what this looks like in practice in a little bit, but first I wanted to define some terms and then give you a brief introduction to the history and philosophy of this movement. First, generally speaking, when we say violence, we are talking about behavior involving physical force intended to hurt, damage, or kill someone. And so when we say we oppose aggressive violence, we are referring to violence that is intentionally perpetrated by an aggressor against a victim. This does not include force used in self-defense as that would be defensive instead of aggressive in nature. While the consistent life ethic does include people, uh, the consistent life ethic movement does include pacifists, uh, it is not mandatory to be a pacifist, although it is certainly welcome. We oppose these acts of aggressive violence because they are contrary to our shared inherent human dignity. As humans, we are members of a rational species and have an existence that is unique and unrepeatable. This selfhood of each and every individual human being is what makes it such that you can't just swap out one person for another. Further, what makes us unique is not just our physical appearance or makeup. There is something greater an untouchable aspect of ourself, some je ne sais quoi to who we are as human beings that makes it impossible to replace any one of us. When a human being is killed, someone irreplaceable and totally unique in all of time and space has ended. This is part of why this opposition to aggressive violence is so foundational to the consistent life ethic. People from all different backgrounds, races, faiths, and politics embrace this philosophy because it is one with human dignity at its core. The basics, I, these basics, I, basic ideas of human dignity and nonviolence that the ethic is based on have been present in many different religious, spiritual, and philosophical traditions across the globe. However, the current iteration of our movement can be traced back to the intersections of the anti-war and anti-abortion movements of the United States in the 1970s. Originally, it was referred to as the seamless garment approach to human rights. The term seamless garment was coined by Catholic pacifist Eileen Egan in 1971. The protection of life, Egan said, is a seamless garment. You can't protect some life and not others. The title for this philosophy as the consistent life ethic was popularized in the 1980s by Cardinal Joseph Bernardin of Chicago. The movement gained substantial momentum with Bernardin, who felt that Catholic social teaching demanded a holistic approach to issues of human rights and dignity. He later went on to clarify that while his personal inspiration for holding the philosophy came from New Testament principles, he didn't believe that this philosophy was inherently Catholic or even Christian, calling people from all walks of life to have a greater consistency in our approach to protecting human rights. Also in the 1980s, the Consistent Life Network, which at that time was known as Pro-Lifers for Survival and then the Seamless Garment Network was formed. Since then, their goal has been to unite many organizations and individuals who support the consistent life ethic, including Rehumanize International. And today, Consistent Life Network is one of the sponsors of this conference. So that leads us to today. The consistent life ethic is a growing movement of diverse people all working to build a more just world. In practice, 
We are on the front lines working to end war, abortion, capital punishment, torture, police brutality, embryo destruction, euthanasia, and all forms of violent discrimination and abuse. We believe that every human being has the inherent right to live free from aggressive violence. We are a nonviolent movement who seek to call in those who disagree with us and challenge these violent institutions and policies from a place of mutual understanding and respect. We recognize that it is not enough to respect the dignity of those who we seek to protect, the aborted, the persecuted, the bombed, but also those on the other side of the aisle. We are conscientious objectors to the culture war. We know that being pro-life doesn't end with overturning Roe v. Wade. We must work to support a culture of life in all facets, from domestic policy that truly supports pregnant people and families, to foreign policy that rejects imperialism and war making. Our love for our neighbor cannot end with our neighbor who looks like us or who thinks like us. We must extend this love, or at the very least respect, to those at the margins. Incarcerated people facing our violent carceral system, trans and gender nonconforming people at risk for discrimination and abuse, humans still in their embryonic and fetal stages of development who are routinely denied the right to life, and immigrants and refugees seeking a better life. We must stand with our disabled and ill friends who are at risk of euthanasia and assisted suicide legislation that creates an ableist double standard wherein some, the healthy or worthy, are given suicide prevention while the rest are given suicide assistance. In this work, you will often find that whatever group you are trying to defend or stand with, it is likely that they have been dehumanized be it through the use of slurs or comparing marginalized groups to animals or parasites, or be it less direct means, dehumanization leads to violence and abuse. So as supporters of the consistent life ethic, we must work to stomp it out wherever we find it. The most obvious example we see today, but not the only one, is the near constant dehumanization of the unborn as simply clumps of cells or parasites. In the context of IVF and embryonic stem cell research, these children are even considered as simply property with no legal rights whatsoever. You can even sometimes hear proponents say that they recognize the humanity of the unborn, which I appreciate because of course the scientific community is at a consensus that the product of same species reproduction is also a differentiated member of that same species and that during a human reproduction what is produced at fertilization or conception is a genetically distinct whole living human organism can you tell i've done that before anyway some people will still claim that despite all that despite all the science that these humans with distinct human a human dna are not human beings or persons if you have ever thought this about the unborn or any group of people, I seriously urge you to reconsider this position. Think historically about the groups of human beings who have had their personhood stripped away. Do you really want to be in the company of their oppressors? Forgive me, but ultimately, I believe that this very concept of personhood is an illegitimate social and legal construct that throughout history has almost exclusively been used to discriminate against whole classes of human beings. The consistent life ethic calls us to stand for human rights, not person rights, because the definition of who can or can't be a person is ultimately a political and ideological debate that ignores basic scientific facts. If there could ever be a category of human non-persons, then personhood is either a useless signifier at best or dangerous and deadly at worst. If we are going to claim to be supporters of human rights, we must apply them to all humans. Thankfully, more and more people are recognizing this. Since the modern wave of anti-war, pro-life, feminist, and other human rights advocacy in the early 2010s, the consistent life ethic has gained new partner organizations and voices spreading this philosophy far and wide. As we have seen time and time again, 
young people crave the consistency, authenticity, and inclusion that the consistent life ethic movement satisfies well. We hope that you, too, will find a place in this movement. Before I go on, I want to address some frequently asked questions, concerns, and criticisms of this movement. The first being that holding the consistent life ethic is distracting, that it forces you to work on too many things at once, or that you can never focus enough attention on any one issue or cause. Honestly, I believe this is a reasonable objection. Time and resources are finite especially when you are working on an underfunded shoestring budget like we so frequently are. Please donate today at rehumanizeintl.org slash donate to make this point easier for me to argue in the future. But until then, ultimately, yeah, the consistent life ethic at its core does require opposition to all acts of aggressive violence against human beings. However, that does not mean that you necessarily need to view every issue with the same amount of weight or dedicate the same amount of time to each. For example, here at Rehumanize International, we have made the intentional decision to focus our advocacy primarily on issues that involve state-sanctioned violence against human beings, meaning we work to end the forms of violence that are currently legal or widely socially acceptable. We just find that it's most worthwhile to direct our energy on these things because changing hearts and minds on these issues can lead, we hope, to the legislative change that is necessary to achieve equal rights for all under the law. Of course, everyone still on our team still opposes illegal violence, such as homicide and assault, but we don't spend our time advocating against them because most people already agree. That doesn't mean that it's bad to work to end something like human trafficking or child abuse, just that it's not our focus as a consistent life ethic organization. You can hold a consistent life ethic and focus on an issue like that. And in fact, I invite you to. There are also people who hold a consistent life ethic who choose to focus on single issue advocacy against one of, our, one of the core issues that we also oppose. I believe that people should be encouraged to work for good in any way they can, so I support that. For example, if you personally have been touched by the violence of war, it makes sense that you would be passionate about working to end imperialism, and it's okay to focus on that. Or if you feel that you are most skilled at debating people about the death penalty, that's great, please continue doing that. Or if you recognize that by the numbers, abortion kills more people than any other act of violence, so you decide you want to focus on that one, awesome. Please do so. I'm excited to work with you. We all have different passions and talents. And if you are using your gifts to build a culture of peace and life in some way, I will not be mad at you for not doing it the exact way that I do. Regardless of how you work for human rights, I am grateful for your work. But I also want to challenge you to consider embracing the consistent life ethic if you don't already. I can tell you that ultimately, I choose to organize under the umbrella of the consistent life ethic movement for two reasons. The first and primary reason is just that I simply believe in this philosophy. I really do think that if any of us are going to claim to be supporters of human rights, that should apply to all humans, regardless of race, age, size, gender identity, sexuality, ability level, location, immigration status, religion, innocence, guilt, or any other characteristic that I am forgetting. But if that reason's not good enough for you, the second reason might be. Even if you don't already fully embrace the rehumanized position on any one of the issues that will be addressed at this conference today, and after you attend all the sessions and learn all you can, you walk away still disagreeing with us on one or more of the issues. I really encourage you to remain open to the consistent life ethic and those who hold it. And that's because we may be useful to you in your single issue advocacy. In our hyper polarized climate, in many cases, the consistent life ethic effectively tears down the barriers to productive dialogue that can exist by shutting down assumptions and shifting perceptions. In order to get someone to listen to you on any one issue, be it abortion or police brutality, war or whatever, it is crucial to be able to demonstrate sameness. 
ultimately, a left-wing pro-abortion person is going to take your pro-life position more seriously if you've already proven to them that you care about people after they're born by showing up for causes they care about. I can't tell you how many times people have told me that they would have never listened to me spouting off on my crazy pro-life talking points if they had thought that I was a hypocrite. And some of those people today are now pro-life activists who are more effective than I'll ever be at reaching pro-life liberals because they can demonstrate even more sameness. If someone sees you at a Black Lives Matter rally protest in your city or rallying to abolish the death penalty in your state, they are not going to be able to use the tired old pro-lifers are bigoted, mega Christian fascist talking point that has been drilled into them and they might actually get a chance to think about the issue for the first time in their lives, and you can be there to guide them in the right direction. At the same time, on the other hand, if you are someone who goes around painting all anti-abortion conservatives as those racist, not really pro-life hypocrites, those conservatives are probably not going to want to listen to you or work with you when it comes time to abolish the death penalty or work to cut the Pentagon's budget, even though they might be some of your best potential allies. Unfortunately, people are quick to completely write you off or cancel you before hearing you out based on assumptions. The consistent life ethic gives you a chance to interrupt those patterns and reach people who were previously unreachable. So another unfortunate objection I've also heard to the consistent life ethic is that, well, I couldn't possibly embrace the ethic because I'm not, insert something irrelevant here. I have heard just about everything. I've both been told by people that they thought the consistent life ethic movement was just a liberal thing. And other people who have said just a conservative thing. I've heard that it's only for members of a specific religious group or that it's only for atheists or that it's only for young people or feminists or girls with blue hair or people who have a particular view on government spending or same-sex marriage or some other issue that is not related to acts of aggressive violence against human beings. I am here to tell you that is not true. If you support the right to life for all people in all circumstances, you are welcome in this movement. Like Amy said earlier, here at Rehumanize International, we like to say that we embrace a philosophy of radical inclusivity. To us, that means being both inclusive of who we work to protect and who we work with in order to achieve these goals. With the consistent life ethic as our guiding principle, we aim to leave no human being out of our realm of consideration when it comes to human rights. We oppose violence against all types of people, even though that might make us unpopular in certain circles. We recognize that we must work to challenge ourselves and our allies to be cognizant of our own implicit biases that may lead us to unconsciously dehumanize or exclude certain people or groups. But again, we are also inclusive when it comes to the people we work with. Our movement is made up of atheists like me, working with Christians, Buddhists, and Muslims, liberals, leftists, conservatives, and libertarians, people of all ages, races, sexualities, gender identity, without regard for ability level, immigration status, nationality, or anything else. We truly seek to be a movement of every human working for every human. And we want you to join us. So. Thank you for coming to this conference today. Whether this is your eighth Rehumanized conference and you've been involved in this movement for longer than I've even been alive, or this is your first and you have only just heard the phrase consistent life ethic for the first time about 20 minutes ago, welcome. I am glad you are here. We have a fabulous docket of speakers who are all experts, each in their own way on all of the issues that will be addressed. I hope that you are ready to learn from our speakers and meet with other attendees who are all as passionate as you are about human rights, life, and dignity. But I don't just want you to learn and network. I want you to take action and I wanna help you do that. So there are plenty of ways to live out these principles. 
all involving different levels of commitment. At minimum, you could simply avoid committing acts of aggressive violence against human beings in your own life. Choose life in the event of an unplanned pregnancy. Do not get a job as an executioner. Do not commit war crimes, etc. Please don't do those things. Um, if you look at the consistent life ethic as simply a list of actions that are wrong to take part in, then this would be sufficient. However, we know that this philosophy is more than that. Because the modern world is plagued both by violence and a sense of apathy about or acceptance of that violence, it is critical that we unsettle this status quo. Rehumanize, after all, is a verb. This philosophy is much more than passively saying no to violence. Rather, we must actively affirm the value of each and every individual human life. We must agitate the systems and institutions of injustice and confront those who uphold and defend them. Fundamentally, this work is that of changing hearts and minds. The most effective way to do this is regular contact with both those who agree and disagree on these vital issues. In other words, if the problem is violence and dehumanization, the answer is connection, community, and rehumanization. So how do we do this? In order to truly transform our world, we first much, must transform our communities. First, figure out if you know anyone in your area who you may want to work with to end violence against all human beings. Check to see if you have a local rehumanized chapter in your area. If so, contact them and join their efforts. They are here and represented today. If you don't already have a chapter in your area, Another option is to consider starting one for yourself. Rehumanized chapters are local organizations fully dedicated to the mission and vision of Rehumanize International. They get access to the support of the Rehumanize team for guidance, web-based lectures and trainings, event and campaign assistance, promotion, and the ability to work with us to host in-person events such as speaking engagements and even a future Rehumanize conference if it ever becomes safe for us to meet in person again, which I hope it does. Rehumanized chapters have the practical support to educate, connect, and restore in their communities that which a culture of violence deforms, the sense of a deep value and dignity of each individual person. Later tonight, there will actually be an opportunity for you to network with other attendees in your geographic region, so perhaps you will be able to get activated in this movement today. For more information on Rehumanized Chapters, you can visit rehumanizeintl.org slash community. I forgot to tell my team to please put that in the chat. So please someone put that in the chat when you hear that. Thank you. Um, rehumanizeintl.org slash community. Uh, but if you are not ready for the commitment of an entire Rehumanized Chapter, that is all right as well. There are still plenty of things that you can do by yourself or with just one or two friends. And I am going to list, list off a few suggestions, um, but we encourage you to work together today and brainstorm other ideas that may suit your skills and your interest. Uh, you can also visit that rehumanizeintl.org slash community link for more suggestions. Um, but I do just wanna give you some examples so I'm not just leaving you with a philosophy and no practical tips. Um, so these ideas are split up into education, service, and activism. Let me see. You can educate by starting conversations with your friends and family about the consistent life ethic and advocate for your positions. Attend online and in-person events that Rehumanize and other like-minded organizations hold and encourage your friends to come. Share posts on social media, wear t-shirts, buttons, patches, and other merch with consistent life ethic messaging. You can visit rehumanizeintl.org slash shop if you need some. Uh, you can also write blog posts, articles, and op-eds. You can perform service in your community by doing sidewalk advocacy outside of an abortion clinic. If you've never done this before, visit rehumanizeintl.org slash sidewalk dash outreach for tips on effective outreach. Uh, you can host fundraisers and item strives for local service nonprofits. Think pregnancy center, domestic violence shelter, or immigrant and refugee resource center. You can write letters to incarcerated people, including those on death row. You can volunteer at a soup kitchen or food bank. You can visit with residents at a nursing or maternity home. 
Uh, and you can serve by creating and distributing portable first aid and toiletry kits for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, for activism, you can attend the National March for Life or your local and state marches. You can organize an anti-war rally in your city or campaign to local institutions like banks and universities to divest from the military industrial complex, the abortion industry, or private prisons and detention centers. And you can speak to your elected officials about the life issues. Again, these are just some suggestions for ways that you can get activated in the movement for every human life. I encourage you to think about your talents and passions and figure out where you fit into this movement. None of us are going to be able to end abortion or capital punishment or euthanasia or any form of violence on our own. We all need to work together to combat these violent institutions and the societal structures that uphold them. We need you. So thank you again to everyone who has been active in this movement over the years. And if this is your first step in getting involved, welcome. Let's get to work. Thank you.